Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Monday, December 12th Council Committee of the Whole Meeting. And I would like to just make a couple of announcements. One, I apologize. Last week, I forgot to send a congratulations out to the Titans Provincial Tier for Champs. Unbelievable. It was a 22-21 game. My husband actually attended it and said it was like just exciting right down to the, down to the wire. But what I really like was the quote that uh, Ken Fournier made was, we always tell them being a champion is the decisions you make every day, not the batter at the end of the year. So nice quote, Ken. Also, I would like to uh, remind everybody the Salvation Army is very, very, very short on volunteers for their kettles. So if you have a couple hours that you can spare to be at a kettle, please uh, stop at the Salvation Army or call them. They're looking for help. And uh, it's, again, it's just a couple hours and it's a good opportunity to visit with the residents of the Valley. So if you have time, please contact them. Uh, does anybody have any additions to the agenda? Um, oh yes, I've got one more announcement. The Salvation Army, or the Yavis Family Restaurant is having the Christmas dinner on Christmas Day, I believe it's from 10.30. Um, don't quote me. I have it in my calendar here somewhere. Uh, just give me a second, because I think it's important to let everyone know about this, if you have the time. Anyways, it should be on the website somewhere, but it's, it's definitely Christmas Day, and they're looking for volunteers, as well as if you have time to, if you don't have time to volunteer, they are collecting funds and food for the Salvation Army. So I do have it. It's December 25th, 11.30 to 3.30. Turkey with all the fixings, dine-in and take-out only. There's no deliveries this year. And they will be accepting food and financial donations, which will go to the Salvation Army. Uh, so please, if you're interested in that, contact the Avis restaurant at 823-8317. All right, did I miss any other ones? Okay, so there's no additions to the agenda. Can I get adoption of the agenda, please? Lisa? I move that council adopt the agenda for the November 14th, 2022 Committee of the Whole meeting as presented. Thank you, seconder. Patrick, all in favor? Carrie, can I get a motion of the minutes of November 14th, Committee of the Whole meeting, please? Tony? I move that the council approve the minutes of the November 14, 2022 committee. The whole meeting is presented. Seconder, please. Crystal? Comments? Just on uh, Lisa's first motion, she said November 14th agenda. Oh, sorry, December 12th, men. Oh, she just read the next one. Okay. Okay. Can I just, can you accept the friendly amendment? Absolutely. Okay, so all in favor of December 12th, carried. Okay, um, all in favor of the motion for, I need a seconder on the, on the minutes of November 14th. It was Crystal, okay. So all in favor, carried. And can I get a motion to accept the minutes of the Drumheller Housing uh, meetings of August? August, March to August, September and October, please. Patrick. I move to accept as information the minutes from the March and August 2022 Drumheller Housing Administration meeting and September and October 2022 Municipal Planning Commission meeting as presented. Seconder, please. Stephanie, all in f any comments? Sorry, I got all in favor. Carried. All right, we are going to move on to Badlands Amphitheater 2022 Events and Development Report. Welcome to Council Meeting, and uh, it's exciting to hear all an update. So all we'll right. let you take it away, Vance. Well, hello, everyone. I'm going to stick to the script to get us through on time. So on behalf of the Badlands Amphitheater staff, volunteers, board, and society members, we want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak about the Badlands Amphitheater. And with me today is Elisa our artistic director, and of course, John Bruins, our longtime board president. So 
We were last here in 2018, and since that time, of course, the arts and culture community has met many challenges and created many new opportunities. Uh, just a reminder that Badlands Amphitheater is a registered charitable organization founded in 1991. Uh, we present exceptional programs and events in a rural setting by offsetting costs with tax-deductible donations and grant. Our mission and approved CRA, CRA objectives are as follows. Number one, to advance the public's appreciation of the arts by providing high quality artistic performances in the Drumheller Valley in the heart of the Canadian Badlands. And number two, to advance education by providing instructional seminars on topics relating to the performing and visual arts to aspiring actors and artists. And that's an aspect of our mission that is still in the planning stages and very much dependent on solving our need for artists and residents housing at the amphitheater site itself. Core values guiding the development of our plans are our three core values. Celebration, infusing our iconic site with beauty and artistic excellence. Creation, producing innovative arts and culture experiences. Community, enhancing community life through life-affirming events and relationships. So what we're going to talk about today, the 2022 return of the Badlands Amphitheater, the relaunch season progress on our Badlands Art Centre, and then coming up in 2023, the diversified art, culture, and tourism offerings, and then closing with support for the Badlands Amphitheatre itself. The Badlands Passion Play returned to the stage this year, and we completely revi revisioned the process. We reduced the budget in light of post-pandemic realities, and we did meet our goals despite having the lowest number of tickets sold in a single season since we started in 1994. So to reiterate, we sold more tickets in our opening season in 1994 and in every season after that than we did this year. So with 27 seasons of development, the annual play is our flagship program and it's an economic tourism dollar driver for the local community. Over 3.8 million was spent in the area during the 2022 Badlands Passion Play and that dollar figure does not include the significant spending by the production professionals and actors we hire from across Canada who live in our on-site accommodations and spend a good portion of their contracted pay right here in Drumheller. We were able to move forward with many new events in the 2022 relaunch year, thanks of course to the hiring of our artistic director, Elisa. In 2022, we were able to add two brand new events with funding assistance from Travel Alberta and the Canadian Heritage Fund. These events were Badlands VanFest and LightFest. VanFest brought us into a new market demographic and expanded our reach into the camping and tourism audiences. This weekend was packed full of activities. One of our workshop hosts has attended many such events around North America and said that this was one of the best run events she has ever attended. Multi-day events like this have people staying in the area and increased tourism dollars. In the future, we would like to revisit the possibility of an on-site camping in the East Lot, which is owned by the town of Drumheller. For 2023, we are looking at dates in July to continue to develop this event while building our sponsorship community and growing our new audiences. And of course, the great big weekend. So events of this magnitude, when you're looking at these things in a small rural center, is dependent upon sponsorships, donors, and grants. Uh, the production costs of these larger concerts, concerts, the margins are extremely narrow, yet our contribution to the arts and culture scene are large with artist fees, sound and stage, production staff, etc. The local economic impact is significant, and these two concerts alone in 2022 generated $1.4 million of local spending outside of our own production costs. Challenges faced this year came from an increased number of events across the province. FM Systems, one of our key partners, nearly tripled the amount of events they worked this summer. With all the demand came rising costs and many places experienced lower attendance. In fact, in Drumheller, we can be proud. We sold out our Bare Naked Ladies concert, but in Calgary, with the same number of seats, they fell short. Way to go, Drumheller. Our biggest challenge was marked by shortage of labour and event volunteers, as Tom has already noted, with the kettles. Uh, we were able to overcome some of those challenges by partnering with other local charities and offering an honorarium for volunteer shift filled by to other nonprofit groups in the valley and we intend to keep doing that great big weekend 2022 featured bare naked ladies and tom cochran and they joined the list of iconic performers who have played the amphitheater over the years as noted it's the sponsors donors and supporters that are the key players in making these large-scale events possible, and we hope to have the 2023 lineup out shortly. 
This year, we also brought back our Roots, Blues, and Barbecue event. This event attracts many people from outside Drumheller to experience this recognized art form. Incredible talent from across Canada have played this stage throughout the five years of this event, including recognized names from within these genres. We expect to see continued growth for this popular event in September of 2023. This Sunday night, we wrapped up five weekends of free public light fest events with Journey to Bethlehem, which was an immersive theatrical living nativity. It all started on November 12th with Memories of Light, a celebration of all who helped us move through the last few difficult years. Each week had a different theme celebrating the Badlands and our local area, Memories of Light, the Night Skies, Story of the Land, and Winter Celebration. Sponsored by Canadian Heritage, the grant for this event through, flowed through the amp and out to the local community. If you had trouble finding ice salt, we were likely the culprits. Local accommodations also enjoyed an increase in overnight stays during the winter season. Our surveys are going out this week and we'll have economic numbers in the new year. A cultural awareness event at our site in October, sponsored by Indigenous Tourism Alberta, connected us to Brown Bear Women events, and they were able to join us for our Story of the Land weekend, along with Lynn Fibrick and a group of local artisans for our local Indigenous craft market. We gained over 1,000 new newsletter community members through the Lightfest event alone, and are now seeing over 36,000 followers across our platforms. These higher counts means we can build better relationships with sponsors, increase revenue, and increase awareness of not just the AMP, but the Drumheller region as a whole. And then, of course, the Badlands Art Centre, and this is our great big dream. And despite incredible challenges since breaking ground just before the pandemic, we have been able to keep building and making use of the space for our programs and our wood-fired barbecue kitchen sponsored by Travel Alberta with our custom-built vault that can smoke 600 pounds of brisket at a time has come into play. So that we get asked, why a regional art centre? Because we will be going year-round. The goal is to be running events every month of the year. In 2022, we ran from May to December, and we will soon launch out into more winter events in the new studio space. The Badlands Amphitheatre is Canada's largest outdoor theatre stage and sits in the centre of a 400-acre natural Badlands site. It is a culmination of 30 years of ambitious visioning projects, successfully completed by thousands of hours of volunteer labour and goods and services provided by local businesses and professionals. Why develop more events? because running events throughout the year diversifies our income and our sponsorship opportunities and makes for a healthier nonprofit organization. In addition, our regular year-round staff and 30 summer staff, the Badlands Arts Centre is creating three new full-time positions, artistic creative director, culinary and food services manager, and a facilities manager, as well as permanent part-time positions. Since its inception, federal and provincial and private grants have contributed over $1.3 million towards the construction of our facility. Many private donors have contributed toward the product as well. The Badlands Art Centre is a part of a suite of indoor and outdoor spaces. The new Badlands Art Centre is a key step in the progression toward the development of a more comprehensive centre of the arts, a complement to the overall Alberta art scene right here on the eastern side of Alberta. The Badlands Event Hall, the lower event hall, contains the culinary side of the Art Centre and will house a suite of kitchen spaces as well as a dining and service area. The lower level of the Badlands Art Centre will support the economic revitalization of our culinary partners and assist in establishing the Drumheller Valley as a culinary tourism destination. Now, if you're a Doctor Who fan, you'll understand the comment we get from almost every person who comes up to the studio because it's much bigger on the inside than it looks like from the outside. The studio is a 50 by 50 foot space with an 18 foot ceiling, and when completed and equipped through a federal grant, the studio will function like a black box production space with movable seating and stage risers and a full complement of sound and lighting equipment controlled from the booth and the catwalk at the far end. The studio space represents new collaborations between artists, creators, audiences, building upon our relationships with opera companies, theatre groups, musicians, digital artists, composers, and scriptwriters. As noted earlier, with supply chain issues, contractor delays, and volatile material cost changes, progress has been incremental and much slower than we desired, but we continue to make good progress on the things we have completed and the things we have in progress. We do note 
that before we can obtain our occupancy permit, and we are very grateful for the temporary ones for events so far, we need to resolve the requirement for the installation of an additional fire hydrant. This is not in our original budgets, and this project is estimated to cost between seventy dollars and $100,000. Uh, just for your information, the fire hydrant is, would be uh, where the blue spot is on this particular map. The red outline is the town property that comprises our east parking lot. The green square is where is there is a stub of the existing water line, and the blue dotted line would connect it to a blue new fire hydrant and then back into the existing, creating a loop that allows for much more pressure and flow that is needed to service that new building. So the estimated cost, as I've noted, and we are going to come and request that at some point in time, we might receive some municipal assistance in bringing that water line across the town property and to the hydrant to ward the new building. Local spending. We are a conduit for government grants, donations and sponsorships from outside the community into our town. Over 80% of our donations come from outside Drumheller. And there has been $700,000 in local spending that has gone through the Art Centre alone into the Drumheller and area this past year. January to March of each year is a time of low ticket sales, donations and sponsorships. December is a key time for us to prepare for those months. So we run what's called Light Up the Amp as a program to secure the operational funds required to keep the staff employed, the buildings heated, and the lights and computers powered up through the cold winter months ahead. To date, we have not approached this council for municipal funding, but the challenges to expand our programs for 2023 will require everyone pulling together to keep Drumheller's Badlands Amphitheater moving forward into the future. When I arrived 14 years ago, we ran only one event, the Passion Play, for only two weekends and six performances, and then the amp lay unused and empty for the rest of the year. Now we are on the verge of a full year of programs at our new regional arts center. We are a CRA nonprofit charity operating in the town of Drumheller to the town's benefit, and we intend to do so to keep moving forward and do much more of the same. After two years of pandemic-related cancellations and challenges, we welcome municipal support of the Badlands Amphitheater to assist us as we develop ongoing tourism and cultural programming into the future. And to that end, we have submitted an application for the Community Assistance Fund. Drummeller has a national and international presence, and the Badlands Amphitheater fits well into that reputation and provides a growing arts and cultural piece of the overall picture. As Travel Drumheller has noted, over the next three years, the government of Alberta has identified tourism as a priority sector for economic growth and job creation. Drumheller and area has been highlighted as a key corridor to promote the Canadian Badlands and has been identified as a focus area for Travel Alberta. And despite the many challenges, the Badlands Amphitheatre community is excited to move forward, creating exciting nonprofit arts, culture, and tourism experiences and increasing our economic and cultural impact in the Canadian Badlands and especially here at home in Drumheller. And we would welcome any questions or comments so I don't have to keep talking. <laughs> Great presentation, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing Alicia did a lot of the putting together PowerPoint. Uh, yeah, with <laughs> conjunction with our marketing manager as well. Okay, and she's well, also the one that said stick to the script. <laughs> well done, well done. All right, council, comments, please. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the great presentation. Um, I, for one, am, I'm a big Passion Play Badlands Amp supporter. I, I think I've been to virtually every performance in the amphitheater uh, over the years, and they've all been great. You know, like like I tell people, I mean, it's one of the good things about living in Drumheller. Um, and and I have a number of people who have never been to any. And I say, well, you're, you're missing out on one of the good things that it is to live in Drumheller if you don't go to some of these performances. So very much appreciate uh, all you do. The other second thing, as you already noted, I mean, I go there and I see lots of lots. people that I don't know. And I'm going, wow, you know, if I don't know, I mean, I've lived in the valley for 45 years. If I don't know these people, then they're coming from out of town. So I see lots and lots of people coming from out of town to attend these events, which, as you say, is wonderful. I mean, every time a person in, comes into the valley and spends a dollar, that dollar goes around and around and around. Um, and we certainly appreciate that. 
Um, just a, a couple of comments as well. Uh, and one of the things you didn't even mention there that, that I thoroughly enjoyed this past year was the Indigenous Cultural Awareness Workshop that was done. You know, you're doing things like that that, that don't even make your presentation um, that I thought was wonderful. I mean, Lynn had the map of kind of Canada, which was as big as this room, you know, and you could spread that out and, you know, stuff like that is, is really valuable and, and wonderful. Uh, one comment about fundraising, and, and I've mentioned this to you before, uh, plans for casinos. So I look around at all of the nonprofit groups in Drumheller, they all do casinos. Um, in fact, I'm doing one tomorrow and Wednesday for the Drumheller Health Foundation. And because we are in the new casino in Calgary now, since the end of November, we're looking at, they're, they're speculating about $80,000 to do two-day casino. Um, and, and I know the Passion Play has never done casinos, and I'm just wondering if there are plans to do that, get into that, that revenue-generating stream. Most definitely. The application is going in, thanks to your advice, Tom. Just saying. Um, second thing I want to mention about the fire hydrant, um, so, and, and I'm wondering if there might be an opportunity for a partnership there, um, that, that because it is some of the town property, uh, we'll have to get Dave working on that and see how much the cost might be. And, and, you know, I mean, it, it's easier for the town to contribute to organizations in kind, uh, than it is, you know, just to give money. Uh, so that, that. I'm glad you brought that up. That might be a, a partnership opportunity there. Well, we can guarantee if we partner together, we'll make sure the parking lot does not burn down. Good point. <laughs> what about all that stuff underneath the parking lot, though, from the old coal mine that we don't want to know about? Uh, might be interesting when you dig up that, that line. <laughs> Dave's shaking and shivering over there. Anyways, thank you very much for the presentation. Anybody else? Tony? Just a quick comment there, Vance. Um, thanks again. Uh, it didn't surprise me that you sold out on both of those concerts. Uh, I was there. They were great again. Um, so continue with a great line up there. And it should be raising you some good coin, I would think, of it being well attended. What did surprise me, though, was that your numbers on the Passion Play were down. It, have you attributed to anything in particular or? Yeah, when we were planning this year, we were looking at coming back from the past two years of nothing. And um, we, we anticipated that they would be lower numbers this year because coming back and rebuilding that audience, we did lose some people um, on social and in our mailing lists when we had nothing going on. So we knew that this would be a re rebuilding year and rebuilding our audience base. Um, so I think that's our main, our main reasoning for why those audience numbers were lower, but thankfully we anticipated that and we adjusted our budgets going into it so that we could continue on based off of the lower budget. Stephanie. So I'm excited to see everything that's happening in the past 14 years and how much you guys have added on. And I really look forward to seeing what else is next to come. So thank you guys. Anybody else? Lisa? Mind my voice, it's a little unsteady today. Um, it was a great presentation, uh, Vance. The fact that you stayed to the script was great. <laughs> Can we teach Tom? Um, but, uh, but that being said, <laughs> it is uh, really fantastic to see how far that's come along, that center. And I'm excited for the future of the generations in our community and outside that can utilize it. So good on you guys for still going forward and getting that done. I think it is a, it serves a niche in our community and it uh, ties in maybe Rosebud or whatnot and you can become a great hub. And uh, I'd like to see perhaps more on the shoulder season, off season, right? Like the rest of us would. So I think that with your plan that you got set forward, that you'll be even more successful. Well, I'll let you know at uh, 9 a.m. tomorrow, we're in a meeting with the federal government on something that may happen yet early 2023. 
So it's kind of a, it's just things are starting to pop up now because people are recognizing and saying, hey, there's a good group to work with. Why don't we see if they'll do this? So it's great fun. Crystal? Just one quick comment. Um, what I really appreciate about LensAMP is your willingness to work with other businesses and other groups in our community and supporting them so that we can support you. So I appreciate always the reaching out and trying to all work together. So um, I don't think a lot of people, the public know that about the Badlands app. So good job on that collaboration. Yeah, I think that's that's been some of the most fun we've had is just talking to people and what do you got and bringing something to the table and going, okay, yeah, let's, let's try that out and see if it works. And it's great, uh, great to see that. Anybody else? Um, the Light Up, the AMP uh, year-end campaign, how is that going? Uh, I think when I last looked at it, our goal is 50,000. I think we're at about 13.4 right now. So we've got a ways to go on that one to, to make it work. So how are you doing it? Just more through social media? Yeah, social media. And then, of course, during Light Fest, it was like a big beacon and those candles were out on every event and we kept bringing it out and people were coming in and new people were coming in uh, to the organization and seeing it for the first time and donating it. But we're finding uh, across the board that uh, volunteerism is down, significantly down. Donations and fundraising, especially on the private side, are really down this year. So it's a bit of more of a, an uphill battle for sure. And in addition to the social media campaigns, we've been doing mail out campaigns uh, that we've sent two out of in the past month. Um, so those have also been going out and the last one just hit the post offices this past week. Ken, I heard something about the Calgary Foundation. You might want to look into. Yeah, it turns out we don't that. qualify there. Oh. The, the dividing line ends at Rosebud. So we finally discovered why we weren't getting in with the Calgary Foundation. We actually belong to the Red Deer Foundations area. Okay. So we've just brokered the starting of conversations with them. Okay. All right. That's good. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I love your outside the box thinking. I'm glad that you have somebody who's kind of keeping you in the... Grounded? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, things don't get done unless you think outside the box. And that's the reason... And so now we just need to figure out how to get you to that financial stability side. And and the housing you were talking about, are you working on that still? Because we all, you know, we all know yes. going into the park, that is probably one of the hardest things is that doesn't look the greatest with all okay. those. So we are obviously in a shorting our housing crisis here in the valley because yeah. You know, we went from 200 plus or more to 30s. So I hope you're working with the feds in the province on. Yeah, feds there in the is province a, and the uh, Alberta Real Estate Board and meeting with Reg this week as well. Okay. And Doug Layton is our consultant on that project and he and his team will put together some cool plans. So we'll present those shortly. Yeah, because that, you know, it would probably be something that you guys could work towards that would help us with especially the, the jobs in the summer. Yeah. I mean, if you could have that accommodation to help you with your people in the in the site besides help yeah. the businesses, museum, all. So make sure you, you know, access the museum and all those other things that, because that could be a really huge hub. Oh, yes. To definitely. solve a lot for, for the municipality overall. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Well, thank you both. And... Um, yeah, we will continue to monitor this and uh, see where it goes. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to Mauricio. 8.1.1, please. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm going to be uh, sharing my presentation here. Uh, just one second. So before I start my presentation, I would like to thank uh, the town's management team and the finance team for all the work that they have done uh, on this, uh, the preparation of the 2023 operating budget and four-year financial plan. Uh, so, uh, 
this is the second time that we are bringing the 2023 operating budget uh, and four-year financial plan to council for review. Uh, since the last presentation, we have added three appendices. So that's appendix, appendix six, seven, and eight. So I will be highlighting some of the <coughs> some of the important things in those, as well as in my report. Uh, but I won't be uh, highlighting everything that I hi highlighted last time um, because I uh, I just want to focus on the on the things that have changed since the, since the last presentation. So one of the things I want to highlight is. Uh, the municipal uh, tax requirement uh, for uh, 2023 is now sitting at 4.8. Um, that's compared to 6.2 that we brought last time. So it's, it is slower. Um, I also want to highlight um, what the tax requisition would be, which is 9, $9,587,000. Uh, eight hundred seventy-five dollars. So again, it's lower than what we presented last time. Um, I would like to also highlight a, a few things. Uh, so how did we how do we come up to uh, to uh, the percentage? So basically, we got the, those major expenditures that make up uh, the increases. So we know about the RCMP contract. Being higher, we have adjusted that one down slightly. Uh, so now it's sitting at 3.8% uh, increase. Uh, there is some new positions that are being presented, um, which we uh, discussed last uh, the last meeting. And uh, there is also some increases in other in other expenditures, which account for around 4.5%. Uh, now again, there were some changes to solid waste, so that decreases expenses, <coughs> um, but there is also a revenue that was also transferred to utilities. So that's the 1.4 that you see there. And other expenditures, uh, sorry, other revenues, uh, they increased by around three, um, sorry, they increased by 275,000, which is equivalent to a 3% uh, decrease in taxes. So that's how we arrive to the 4.8. Um, so that's been updated. I also want to highlight uh, so that this year hasn't changed for this report, but we will be updating it uh, for the next report coming in a week. Uh, so from what we know, uh, the average increase on these municipalities is around is sitting around 5.5 at the moment. Uh, but again, we'll be updating this at the, for the next meeting. Uh, I also want to highlight some changes that we have done to some of the um, programs that you see here. So if you go to, append uh, to the next appendix, which is Appendix 5, the Detailed Budget and Plan, what we have done is we have, um, so in past years, uh, the RCMP and bylaw enforcement were all under one. So that was the 2101. What we have done uh, this time is we have separated the two. So now we have 2101 as enforcement, by law enforcement, and we have 2201 as the RCMP. So the objective of that is to provide more clarity to council and the public on what is what. Um, another change that we have made uh, under this report that you will notice is all the amortization has been consolidated under one line, and you will see it at the, at the end of the report. Um, so that, again, the, the intention for that is to be able to compare apples to apples. Not all departments have amortiz had amortization expense uh, in their budget line, so now everyone uh, will have similar expenditures. And all amortization is, is being accounted for uh, under one line. Uh, I also want to highlight uh, that we have, um, okay, under mosquito control, uh, and just one second, I'm here, right here. 
weed and mosquito control has been combined into one. Uh, we didn't see the need to keep those as a separate uh, programs. So they have been combined. Same with animal control. Those have been combined into bylaw enforcement. So that's why you will see zeros going forward. And same again with mosquito control uh, has been zeroed out and included into one. Uh, some, okay, now when it comes to roads, what we have done is we have actually done the opposite. We have uh, split some of the expenditures on the, that were traditionally on the road. Now they are under <laughs> other programs as well, such as street, uh, sorry, uh, right here, bridges, uh, snow control, sorry, snow and ice removal, I mean, and I believe uh, there was one more change, yes. Uh, under tourism, you will now see that it has been combined. I'm going to move it a little faster, sorry. So right after economic, so tourism will include now everything that was under 6204 as well as 60, <coughs> we have it under, right here, under 6902. So we got rid of 6902 and we combined those two because they essentially are both relating to tourism. So that's part of the consolidation that we have done. Uh, in old cells, what we have done with those is we combined it with town hall. So again, the intention is to, to have more meaningful information for council and the public. Um, the RCMP build, building, as you can see, is now under the RCMP. So it's not on its own. Um, and next we will look at the uh, recreation and administration uh, at the next, uh, when we bring it back uh, next week. We will, uh, we will review this one and see if it needs to be combined with something else. We'll advise at that time. Uh, now I will highlight a little bit about uh, those new appendices that we are presenting tonight. But before I do that, I just want to make sure that I mention where amortization is sitting. So it is sitting under operating contingencies. So we do have a, a bit of a contingency amount here uh, and, and the amortization expenses here too. And we have left the uh, comparatives so that council can see what those were in the past. Okay, so now let's move on to uh, the next appendix, which is appendix six. So this appendix is providing some detailed information on uh, community grants that uh, the town gives out to the community. I want to make a correction though, under uh, CDSP, uh, so this one here, the 15,000, the 10,000, and the 5,000, that 30,000 is actually not allocated, so we will be making that correction when we bring it back. It's actually by application. So we'll have one line, and it will be by application, so it's not, it's not allocated to those organizations, so I want to make that correction and it will be reflected in uh, next time we bring it. Um, okay, so that equals to the amount that is being given to the community in 2023. I also want to mention about the contracted services. Uh, so there is a breakdown there or, or, of what uh, is included in that budget line in the, in the appendix one that you will see uh, in, attached to my report. So it gives you uh, an idea of where, where the funds are going. Um, and of course, there are other expenditures that are under uh, 65,000 that would amount to be 1.2 million, but uh, it's multiple, it's several, uh, several different uh, expenses. And finally, I'm going to be uh, basically, basically just highlighting what, uh, how the, the library gets funded. So 71% of the funds come from the town. 25% comes from other grants, so those can be provincial or federal. 
And then they have some internal revenues that they generate, which is 4%. And tonight we are looking for council direction, uh, direction. so uh, the, our intention is to bring it back uh, on December 19th for adoptions. Uh, so I'll be happy to take any, any questions council may have. Thanks so much, Mauricio. Um, and before I forget, um, I just want to send a shout out to Elin. I know that she works diligently on this, getting this ready for us. And she's at what, year 38 of it. So I know she doesn't like to be acknowledged, but thank you, Elin, for all your work, because I know that you're very viable in this happening. So. All right, council, comments, please. I know there's lots of questions. Crystal, let's start with you. I uh, just have a few. Um, under the grant sections, the $800 to citizens on patrol, what was that uh, amount for? Do we know? Greg, would you, would you like to address that? What, was that through the it, community assistance grant it, application? Yes, that's right. Okay. It, so was, it, it was for gas reimbursement. Okay, and okay so that was part of that grant application. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, and then the $5,000 that we supported the Pregnancy Care Center, they're now returning that money back is my understanding. So will that just go over to the next year as a, into which program, the same program? for the application under the 30,000? So, uh, yes, uh, they are returning those funds. And what uh, basically happens is we underspend the budget. So if we have 30,000 mm -hmm. and we only spend, uh, let's say, 22,000, the 8,000 basically goes to the bottom line or to, okay. to that surplus or deficit. Okay, so it won't be any extra for 2023 for applications? Uh, not unless council uh, direct okay. us to add more funds okay. to... About you. And then my next question, I didn't see anywhere in the roads and sidewalks for uh, the rails to trail with um, budget. So the construction of the rails to trail is through the capital budget. The maintenance of the trail system will be, I believe it's actually under parks. Trails is where the trail system is not under roads and streets. But there was funds allotted in the capital. Uh, Tom? Thank you for the <clears throat> excellent budget and Elin, wonderful job. Um, you must have had good teachers back <laughs> a few years ago. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely amazed you guys are magicians. Uh, I, I absolutely don't understand how we can get away with a 4.8% increase, um, considering the incredible increases in costs of everything over the last two years. I mean, you, you look at diesel fuel and, and simple things like that that have gone up incredible amounts. Uh, so just to do what we've been doing uh, you know, the basic stuff of running the town. I mean, the, the increases there have been astronomical. So I, I'm wondering, you know, you're going to pull a rabbit out of a hat or next next trick or, or whatever. So anyways, excellent job on that. Um, I have a few kind of comments and, and you have done a wonderful job and I, I don't see anywhere that I can, you know, pare down a million dollars or so out of the budget. It, it seems to be you have sharpened your pencils very well and done an excellent job. Um, and I just want to bring up the library, first of all. Uh, cost recovery there, 29%. Um, and I'm just wondering if that could be improved going forward. Uh, you know, we have cost recovery statistics for the pool and for the BCF and for uh, the arena and that. Uh, and, and I'm looking at the amount of money that they're renovating or generating through, you know, memberships and, and that kind of thing. And I would sure like to think that they could, could maybe look at that going forward. Um, you know, it's wonderful to have the library and, and I know they've done a good job coming up with their budget. 
Uh, I just thinking that maybe they have to look at a little bit more revenue generation there. Um, getting back to 2611 and 2612, mosquitoes. Uh, I, I don't know how much we are going to spend on mosquitoes. And, you know, to me, this, this sounds like maybe it's not a big thing, but, but it really is. Uh, we have been very fortunate the last couple of years in Drumheller that we've had basically cold, dry springs, which have been very not conducive to, to breeding a lot of mosquitoes in the spring, and that, that extends right through the whole summer. We do have on occasion, though, uh, when we'll have a wet, warm spring, and mosquito population will go crazy, and we really have to, to me, it's kind of like snow removal. I mean, you don't know. I mean, you really don't know. I mean, you can budget for kind of approximately, uh, but mosquitoes can be a huge detriment to doing anything outside. And, and I've had, you know, we've had occasions in this valley where you couldn't go outside because the mosquitoes would eat you alive. Um, so I, I just want to kind of keep that in mind that, that hopefully there is enough money in the budget for mosquito control should we need it. So what's represented for mosquito control in the budget at this time is, uh, so I gotta do a little bit of explanation of what we do for mosquito control. We do two aspects of mosquito control. One is spraying within our jurisdiction in the sloughs and that, because we can only kill the larva, we can't kill an adult uh, mosquito with the bugs, with the sprays. So we do addition of spraying in the sloughs and water bodies and standing water that's within our jurisdiction. We also do helicopter spraying in a greater area because all those mos mosquitoes fly to Drumheller to eat, basically. So we have two programs in there. We've reduced the budget in the mosquito control historically. We, in bad years, it's been done as many as three times as what I've been told for the helicopter spraying. We budget for one. Last year, we did this in 2022, we never actually used the helicopter spraying. So we budget for one helicopter spray, but if the year is bad enough, we will simply end up going over budget on that item with additional spraying because we cannot predict how many helicopter trips we're going to need. With the spraying insider jurisdiction, again, it is based on need. We've done our best to assess that this is the minimum we would expect to use in a year, but in some years we do use, yes, do use less, but there will be years where we are going to go over budget. And I could not tell you right now if next year is going to be a year where we go over budget or not. It, we do not have the ability to predict that. So we basically bit, uh, predict budget on one helicopter spray and then our normal historical trend in recent period for the rest. If that historical trend goes the other direction all of a sudden, we will be going over budget in that item. Yeah, excellent. Um, I mean, the hundreds of thousands of tourists that come to the valley, if they can't get outside and enjoy a bonfire or whatever, uh, very detrimental. Um, 3203 street lighting. Uh, I, just a little bit of clarification, maybe just for information purposes. So how does our street lighting budget work with ATCO? Like we tell people, if you got a street light out, phone ATCO. Um, and yet we have hundreds of thousands of dollars for street lighting. If you could just... So the bulk of the money in the street lighting in the street lighting area is electrical charges for the street lights. We are responsible for even... So the street lights are considered invested or non-invested. So those are either fully the responsibility of ACO or ACO looks after it and we pay for the costs. Either way, we still have to pay for the electrical charges. So if you look... Of the budget of five hundred, of the budget of four hundred sixty thousand dollars, four hundred fifty-two thousand dollars of that is the electrical charges. The remaining is to cover the costs of the few street lights that we do own and are totally responsible for, such as the decorative lighting in the downtown core, plus the not the ones that are non-invested. Should those come up for repair, we will need to cover those charges in case in certain scenarios. So that. The, the bulk of the charges there, though, I think it's like 90, 90 plus percent is the electricity charge. Okay. 
Um, under 2171, it has wages for council. Um, and I think I've mentioned this before that we don't really get a wage, we get an honorarium. And I, I think that that was going to be changed. It's maybe just missed that again. Um, 2610, animal control with the new humane society, and maybe Greg can answer this. Is there going to be, are we going to be using them more? And is that where some of this, this money is going? Uh, we will when they're able to take dogs longer term. Right now we're, we're taking care of short term lodging ourselves. That's where some of this budget will go though, to the Humane Society for using their service for that? Yes. Yeah, yes, excellent. Uh, 2511, uh, just, I get this comment a lot of times, how come we're paying for clothing and shoes? And I tell them, well, that's part of our collective agreement, uh, right? So clothing and shoes, depending on the department, if it's public works, we supply safety gear. And in some cases, hats and, and hoodies for like the facility guys. For BCF and recreation, we also supply uniforms for those staff. So it all depends on the terms of the collective agreement that's in place for those staff members. And my last comment, see how brief I am today? Don't scowl at me. <laughs> um, the seniors services, um, so it, it doesn't look like very much for senior services, but if you put in 5301, uh, the seniors requisition, um, then we are spending an awful lot of money in this community on seniors because we value those people who are seniors. Uh, and I would just like to mention that even though the requisition to the town is going up, uh, it looks like we will not be increasing the requisition um, overall but the, the cost to the town looks like it's going up $10,000 over last year. Uh, and that I'm assuming is because of equalized assessment because we're not planning on an overall increase on the requisition. Uh, uh, this is the seniors requisition, correct? 5301, I think 5, it is. 5301, yes. I believe, I, okay, so this one, um, we typically pay it in January, and I, and I believe this would be that 2023 requisition that we are going to be paying. Uh, so yes, it's, it's a slightly higher than, than the prior year. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just making the point, it's not because we have increased the seniors requisition, it's simply because the balance of it's based on equalized assessment of the partners and if the town's equalized assessment goes up the cost to the town goes up but it's not because we've actually increased the amount of the overall requisition starland pays less by the way who's next tony yeah good work on this uh, Maurice Hill. I like the changes that you highlighted, especially with the removal of the amortization and, and putting it all on one line. It's, it's much easier to compare department to department. I especially like you all the work that you did to get it from 6.2 to 4.8. And if you can get it to 4.7, wouldn't make me really happy. But a couple of comments here and, and maybe some answers. On page 56 there, you outlined the uh, police services. And I, I just want to note again that this is going to account for the most significant part of the proposed increase we're talking about here. Uh, it accounts for 3.8% of the property taxes just in total cost of policing. The next area though, fire protection is providing an equal impact as well. And I'm just wondering if it should be broke out on page 50 there where you recapped the, the percentage increases uh, for the totals. Um, you're looking at a 1.2% property tax increase to cover that. But I also note under there, like most of salaries, education, training, but the dispatch contract, has that gone up $10,000? 
fixed or is it a fixed term contract or, or how does that run? Oh, uh, Mr. Locker, I can't quote the exact numbers, sir. I'd be happy to dig into it and look, but it does go up. There is a gradient. It goes up every year. Uh, okay. It's on a per capita, the 911 charges. Um, our contract goes up a little bit every year. Um, but I'd be happy to come back with the exact numbers. I don't have them right now. Yeah, it just seems because it's going from twenty to thirty thousand dollars, which is kind of like a fifty no, percent increase. No, it wouldn't. On, I don't think it wouldn't move much. that much. I don't believe so, but I'd be happy to get the real numbers. Okay, so maybe yeah. we can just take a look at that number and make sure we got the right number in there. Um, and then I think it's it's worth noting to break it out on on page fifty there as as a separate line, so we could have police and fire identified in there. My next uh, was in on page 63, uh, the airport line. And I still note that we're running expenses of $73,000. Is the new revenue model designed to cover and bring this back to a break even operation? And is that going to happen in 2023? Uh, so I can speak to that. The long term is that we would, the goal of uh, the airport commission and the airport manager that we've got there is to get it so that the airport is an advantage to us rather than a cost. So we would like to see it as a break even at the very least, potentially bringing some in. That being said, that's a long, that's a longer term plan. That's not going to be something that comes in in 23. Um, I did supply to Mauricio uh, revenue amount for uh, next for 23 that's estimated based on the new fees and the fuel sales. Um, it's not going to be the $70,000. We're not getting full cost recovery yet. We will need to do additional changes and, and potentially bring in some additional uh, business and uh, commercial uses there before we can get to that point. But we are heading in that direction. So over time, we should see that number start to fall. That would be my expectation. Great. Um, Page 73, I just had trouble lining up the library here on line 771. Uh, let me just take a look at it here. I was trying to look at your schedule there and align the numbers with uh, the the requisition that that is showing. So we're showing the actuals there for 22 at 258,000 and the 75,000 in rent is rolling together with that to make up the new budget amount of 355, is that correct? Uh, rent, yes, we have rent under grant. So it would be basically uh, in lieu, uh, and, and then we have 216,950, which is the, the actual requisition that they have. But we also have um, Marigold, a requisition for Marigold for 50,000. Oh, is that in that number as well? It is. Yeah. Okay. So I was trying to look at page 76 there, and, and that rent is going to go up to 88 then? 83,750, yeah. So it's the 216, the 88, and the 50,000 there? Yes, 50,335. And then we also pay for their, um, their financial statement preparation. So uh, they are getting a review in the next three years, and then they'll have an audit. So we pay for that, and that's the extra 4,650. No wonder I couldn't line it up. So what's the total <clears throat> then for the library? What do you got there, Tony? Um. Three fifty-five thousand in the budget. I see it as more doable. Page seventy-three. Oh, that's twenty-five seconds. Yeah. Yeah, but we got two sixteen eighty-eight fifty plus the four. Right. And just we, seemed like a larger increase from their actual right now at two fifty-eight. So all the expenses aren't in yet for the library. Uh, we do not have... So we're taking about a $100,000 jump there, right? Yeah, we do not have the uh, rent yet. We do that at year end. So okay. rent is not... Uh, so in that's the not in these numbers yet? No, not yet, no. Okay. 
Uh, two other questions with uh, the library there. Do we cover insurance on the property there? Because I knew I see they have a new line item for insurance, which they didn't have before. So is that over and above what we cover? No, Mr. Locker, our um, make a long story short, our insurer for the longest time was treating a library as if it was honest, but a mistaken belief as an actual part of of uh, of, of the town. And when in fact a closer review by him and myself this year indicated they are a separate board. We ran this through the CIO as well. So they were required to retain their own liability coverage, sir. Hence no their new line item then for yeah. insurance that was never there before? Never there before. No, it was okay. honest but mistaken belief that they were. But okay. Anyway, that's where we're at. And then the other the other piece on that on their budget, they had a two thousand increase for reserves. Are they building their own reserves? Uh, I, I believe that they, uh, if they put money aside for reserves, it would be for any furniture or any, any, anything that they would consider capital. Which is coming out of our budget request. It's included, yes, uh, as we provided a breakdown, yeah, the town contributes 71%. Okay. Yeah. And then just my final questions on page 73 with regards to the BCF. <clears throat> just line 111, the salary increases to 507 to a new budget of 593, um, $86,000 increase. I note revenues are only increasing 75. Are we going out of line here on our staff to, to revenue numbers? Or is there something else in there? Don't have to answer it now. I just kind of take a closer look on, on that line item to see that it's in order. Um, line 221 was advertising and promotion. It's going up $10,000 as well. Is there something special on that line that they propose to do? And if not, I, th I think we need to roll that back a little bit and trying to hold the line here. And then my final question on, on there was on line 831, the interest costs are going from 61,000 actual to 117,000. There's no debt been added to the BCF. I can I can definitely answer that one. Uh, on the actuals, we only have a portion of the year um, interest cost because we do have a payments coming up in December, and when we enter those, we are going to be higher than that sixty one thousand. Um, our budget for twenty twenty two is thirty hundred thirty one thousand, so that tells me that we are missing uh, some interest in twenty twenty two. So in 2023, it's actually going down from from uh, the budget in 2022. And that okay. makes sense because as we pay pay down the debt, uh, the interest costs have to go down. That's that's what I was thinking as well. So so our 22 budget was a little higher than what it probably should have been. And that's why the decrease to 117. And no, uh, like I said, uh, we are still missing some payments. Uh, that are going to be made in December. Is, which is not in the actual number. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. So just a couple lines there if you could check on for me. <clears throat> we will. Thank you. Actually, I think, um, Tony, the one question about salary. So if you look back at 2019's actuals, <clears throat> we were at about 660. And I think so we're lower than we were with our last full year of operation. So they're, they're still, and that's with a couple of years of um, CPI adjustments. So it's not being staffed to the same level as it was in 2019. So I know that so there's less, less people overall in there than there was four years ago. The part that's, <clears throat> you talked about revenue, so the part about advertising is trying to develop a bit more of a marketing plan to be able to bring people to the uh, BCF, either both as members um, for the gym or as for weddings and other conferences. 
Okay, so if it's a designated purpose, yeah, I'd be okay with that, yeah. Patrick? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if this is germane, uh, but um, we've seen more pressure on our community assistance grants, and um, I think part of that was kind of the disappearance of the World's Largest Dinosaur Legacy Grant, you know, probably three or four years ago. And I remember a former uh, economic development officer had kind of brokered a deal with the chamber to use those funds for economic development projects. Does that actually roll into this budget or is it kept as a separate entity or do we know what happens with that? The money, the money from the um, World's Largest Dinosaur Legacy? Yeah. So it's not turned over to us. Um, okay. Unless it's a very specific grant, they they have not made any presentation to us about uh, an offer. What they've been using, you know, we've been partnering with them on storefront improvement grants um, with, with Community Futures as a third partner. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, the legacy grant we haven't seen. Um, other than COVID, the COVID year, we have not seen anything come back to us. So, okay, good. I thought that we kind of brokered a deal to use that proact or. Uh, together but okay well. and it is kind of with that that's with that storefront grant we used to do it as a town on our own okay and now we do it we both match that, that so they do it on the economic features. drive that way okay thanks anybody else lisa everyone else did such a good job asking questions so i just got one query i'm wondering about the odor control for fifth street East is that still in, in the budget, and where can I find that? The odor control for the Fifth Street list station would be under the utility budget, not under the tax supported budget. And we have actually put in the ten year capital plan a request for engine. The plan was engineering services in twenty four to start a conceptual design of a new list station there. With detailed design the fall the year that followed that and construction the year after that. I think it was starting in 24, but it might have been 25. But that would be in the utility budget for the operating expense of the existing odor program. The full addressment of the odor and lift station issues there is in the capital plan within the next few years. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All righty. Okay, I just have a few comments. Um, I agree on the cost recovery of the library. I'd, li I'd like to figure that one out um, because other municipalities I speak to, they do have a, fine, a fee for the library. And I think if we got to build something in the community assistance for those, I think we, the library needs to figure that out. They used to do a lot of fundraising too, which I don't see that being built in here. So. Uh, I'd like to see that. So, so one of the things with the Library Act, the Provincial Library Act, is all council can do is indicate how much money we want to give them. You, you want to give them. Um, <clears throat> what they do with it is, is up to them. So I know that the um, society actually pays for the membership fees, or pays for the membership card. So they, they do have a charge, and that goes back to the society to reimburse them on. So if you look at their detailed um, budget they presented to us, that is in there. So, but yeah, it's an interesting piece and, and just learned about it recently, but we don't have the ability to control their budget other than just say that we want to give them X amount of dollars and it's up to them to figure out what to do with it. Okay, and I agree. I just think we need to, maybe that's where you're, Stephanie, you're on that committee. Maybe we need to get a little bit more information before we, so we know exactly what that number should be. Um, the airport fees and fuel sales, I, uh, I just want to comment on that. Um, the, those sale, fuel sales have like tripled in the last year, however, because we did the airport revamp of the runway and the grant lighting, they've had the airport shut down quite a bit, so I'm looking forward to seeing that number in the future. Uh, the street lighting, I would like to ask, I know it's not here, but could you push a little bit on ACO? I get a lot of complaints on a lot of lights out. 10X, there's a bunch. Uh, number nine, there's a bunch. And 
I know that they're not ours, but everybody pushes them. <laughs> I'll follow up with ACO and with Alberta Transportation on the ones that are on the highway and with ACO on the ones that are on ours. Okay, that'd be great. Go ahead, Lisa. So just on that, I actually put in a complaint through Z Click Fix for some of the power poles or light standards along uh, Riverside Drive East, and the guy from ACO was on it like that. So if anybody has a complaint, tell them to go through Z Click Fix and ACO responds right away. Awesome. So that's for the listening public. Do that. So and Dave can reinforce I'll just, it. Just uh, correct that a little bit. So C click fix, if it comes in through there, it comes to the town. And then we dig around and try and find the information. Then we put it through to ACO. ACO has their own website though, where you can go directly to them to put in the issue of where light is out. And that's directly to them. So there's no middleman trying to dig up additional information to pass it on. If someone does put something in through C click fix, we usually respond that here's the address, the email, at the website for ACO so that they have it. And I believe it is on the town's website and currently on their social media feed as well as to what that link is. And I guess just to add to that, on the polls, there's a metal tag that has a number on it. Please take a picture when you send in your complaint. Very good. Um, okay, and then I had just had a conversation with the Mayor Camor and um, they're looking at about eight plus percent. So uh, congratulations to all of you for getting this down. Uh, when I add up the 4.8 and all the work we're trying to do, when you add 3.8 is RCMP and 1.2 is fire, which we, you know, the, the recommendation was to increase the fire. Uh, that's at 5%. So you guys were able to uh, find funding uh, cut where required. And I know that there's no community that's going to be happy with any increase, but the 3.8 from the, and we need the RCMP, so I'm not, don't get me wrong. It's just something we don't have any control of. So, um, so I just want to send um, a shout out to all of you, the whole team for finding, because obviously you, you did a lot of cuts to get us to where we are here. So thank you. All right. Anything else? Okay, Mauricio, so you'll bring that back. And Dave, are we going to see that parks plan before next week? Sean's work, Sean Solberg has been working on it in the last several days. You'll have an email out probably Thursday morning with the conceptual designs and with a work list for the position that you asked about as well. Okay, good, because I would like to see that. All right, so Mauricio, I, don't, I think you've got the last of the feedback. Thank you for allowing us two or three sessions of doing this. And uh, we'll see the final product next week. Okay, perfect. All right, um, that concludes this. Um, we have to go into closed session. We do have some uh, personal issue or labor and land issues to deal with. So council, can I get a motion, please? Crystal? I move that council close a meeting to the public for discussions related to personal planning, personal evaluation, and land development as per FOIP 16, disclosure harmful to business interests of a third party, FOIP 19, confidential evaluations, FOIP 23, local public body confidences, and it's cut off, so I don't know what else it says. That we should have been just the end of it. Okay, thanks. Okay, seconder please, Lisa, all in favor? carried all right thank you everyone for being with us this week um we will be back next week and we'll close off some of these final loopholes uh wishing you all a great week and take care of yourself out there